Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Hey, Lori. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Do you want to grab a cup of coffee? Coffee would be great. Sounds good. Hello. Americano Vista, please. Thank you. Thank you. So where was your last trip? Ha. Huh. My last trip was like a, a three-week journey. It's like a tour. Wow. I went to Salt Lake City. Wow. And, oh, uh, for the IU Pro. For the IU Pro, Montreal. And then I went to Athens, Georgia. Oh, my goodness. Back to Montreal, and then Quebec City. It's even a mix out of suitcase. Wow. Cool. I just went for the fun of it. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, Richard, what got you started in studying the forest? Well, actually, I was raised in, in the Gaspé Peninsula in, in Quebec. And uh, so the front of my house was the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And then mm. in the back of my house was the woods. So I spent most of my youth going out in the woods, climbing trees, uh, building little houses in the woods. And so I loved the forest since I was just a little boy. But uh, what got me excited about the fungi, mm -hmm. the mycology is, uh, well, I have this crazy uncle. <laughs> I can't imagine don't, that. <laughs> don't we all have a crazy uncle? <laughs> so I got this crazy uncle, um, and he would, uh, he would, he's an amateur mycologist, and he would come out in the summer at our cabin, driving this old Volvo station wagon, <laughs> you know, and I have four brothers, so five little boys. He would pile us up in the Volvo, and then he would drive up a, a forest road, and then stop the car, and then lose us in the wood. <laughs> and basically told us like find mushrooms and then we'd spend the afternoon looking at mushrooms trying to find mushrooms and bring it back and then we'd spend the rest of the day with them trying to put names on these mushrooms wonderful uh, did yeah. you get to eat them well my mom didn't allow that <laughs> now when you first did your phd you were studying genes tree genetics yeah. so what inspired you and how did you get going in that field well you know, the idea, uh, just like I said, I mean, uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, uh, plant pathology could be something that you could study. You know, then when I saw that professor who studied plant pathology, I thought, wow, what a great thing. You know, you can actually work to help plants become more resistant to diseases. And then I, I decided to apply that to trees. Right. Um, so, so this was questions about forest health. Yes, And exactly. how healthy our trees are and, and what our forests Exactly. how healthy our forests are in their yes. environments. Yes, yes, yes. And the reality is that there's, there's natural resistance in trees. Uh, and the idea of using genetics uh, and genomics to, to find out, to discover what makes a resistant tree resistant is what got me really excited about genomics. So when you look around in the forest, do you see evidence of pathogens in the trees in the forest around us? What would you be looking well, for? You know. Uh, every tree I see uh, has the potential for being infected by a pathogen, right? <laughs> is this why they call you Dr. Doom? <laughs> Dr. Doom is what they call me. Because every tree to me has the potential of being a diseased tree. And uh, so, but the reality is that, uh, is that there's, a, a, there's a richness of diversity of fungi and microorganisms in the forest. And, and a lot of these organisms are, are playing a positive role, so they're good for, for the forest. And for example, you see a lot of these decay fungi, right? Mm -hmm. These big kongs coming out of trees. And that means that there's a fungus in there that's rotting the wood. Right. And that plays a very positive role in the ecosystem because the, these rotten trees become wildlife trees. So nesting birds will, will use them and then insects will feed on them. Uh, then eventually they'll crumble down and then they'll, they'll recycle the carbon and the nutrients. So it's really part of the, the natural uh, ecosystem. So Richard, over the course of your career, what would you consider the biggest surprise or maybe your biggest discovery? Well, maybe the, 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 the biggest surprise is that uh, uh, with tree diseases, what you see is not necessarily what you get uh, in the sense that tree pathogens can actually remain hidden uh, either in the trees or in the seeds uh, or even in the roots in the soil and can remain like that for a long time and that's how that's how they can spread around and then when we move these plants or these trees or these seedlings that's how we can transport the pathogen and that's how we got a lot of these invasive pathogens coming our way uh, is through this uh, this spread of these asymptomatic uh, trees 
that we that we ship around thinking, hey, they look green, they're perfectly healthy, but they're not. Oh. They got these hidden pathogens that are not showing showing up yet. We they're invisible to our eyes, uh, and yet they're present. And then we spread them by shipping them all over the place. And we've imported diseases from Europe, from Asia, because of that. And when we discovered that, and we found out that this was that the one of the the main source of invasive pathogen that was like a big wow moment for me. If we look at a tree or if we are looking in the forest and we can't necessarily see all the symptoms, is there a way you can use the genomics to figure out if the trees have a disease? Yeah, that's that's basically what I've been doing in my career for, for, for the last couple of decades is, is actually once we realized that, that was the big one of the biggest problems. And then when that genomics revolution came about, then we, we, we had that eureka moment and we said, well, pathogens have DNA uh, and then we can use the, that DNA to see the pathogen. So we can actually go out fishing for the pathogen in the tree uh, and then uh, detect uh, pathogens, even if they're not visible to the naked eye. So you can have a tree that looks perfectly healthy, take some needles or some leaves, and then go and get the pathogen DNA and, and then detect it so that it becomes visible. So is this a bit like when we hear about medical genetics and people get tests to see if they might be susceptible, say, to a form of cancer or something, we can do something similar for our trees. Exactly, and that's, that's the beauty of uh, the, this genomic revolution is that we're sort of piggybacking, I would say, onto the medical uh, genetics. Uh, who have a lot more money than us forestry <laughs> people, of course. Uh, so they have a lot of resources and then they can develop the kind of test that's actually perfectly applicable to us. So we use the same type of techniques and, and uh, uh, say platform to detect DNA of pathogens or trees as we would for the cancer, for example, when you do cancer screening. Exactly the same type of, uh, once you get to the DNA, you can use exactly the same approach. I wondered if you had some insights into environmental change and, and what we can learn about pathogens and forest conservation. So that's, that's a huge like, black box in, in, in biology. Uh, you know, people have studied climate change from like a single species perspective, like how trees will adapt, you know, with given different climate scenarios. The big black box is how they're going to react to different pathogens, different pests. Uh, we've already seen the mountain pine beetle, how that's been created havoc. Uh, but that's just one, right? So there's all these other uh, pathogens and also the beneficial organisms, the mycorrhizae and the symbionts that might be affected. Uh, so it's a big black box, but we already have a little bit of an insight into, uh, into some, of the, uh, some of the potential impact. So we know that um, climate change will result in, for example, uh, longer summer mm -hmm. uh, and with more humidity at the, ex at the end of the summer, beginning and end. And that creates conditions that are uh, that are conducive because fungi love humidity, right? They love water and they love rain. That's why they're so happy in this forest. <laughs> and uh, so if, the, if climate change mirror, means more of that, means, you know, more diseases. In British Columbia in particular, our forests are just an icon of our environment. And they mean so much to us. Um, here we're in the forest right next to UBC and it's a place where we recreate and where we relax and where we teach and learn. So if people are concerned about our forests and their conservation, what might be things that people could be aware of or could, what could they be doing as individuals? Well, I, think, I think if people could learn more uh, how to recognize, um, well, the different tree species and how to recognize uh, abnormal patterns, uh, just can look up, you know, and look at the uh, look at the forest and, and try to, to figure out if this is normal. The tree's dead there. Why is it dead? Uh, you know, so so that they can get a better feel, a better sensation for uh, you know for the, the health the health of the forest. Because at the end of the day, uh, the forest belongs to all of us, and and it's 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 in every one of us to sort of care for it. So, what does the rest of your term look like? Well, got a lot of teaching to do, a lot of uh, marking exams and, uh, and some little traveling and uh, the regular. How about you? Well, a bit of the same. A couple trips out to take care of um, student graduate thesis defenses and a conference in Alberta.
in December. So I'll Florida. have a couple days. Yeah, nothing like a, a trip to Edmonton in the second <laughs> week in December to make sure you're in the Christmas.